In this episode, we talk about build to let, doing your due diligence, and... Ah, should you give equity or debt investments? Stop! This is, this is, this is Aidan Reese Heron, and you're watching Property Geek TV, episode 27, 31, 33. <laughs> okay, it's reverse engineer what you want to achieve. So where do you want to get to? What do you want to achieve? Win win on both sides, right? And that's what business should be. I'm here to provide value to you. So this is very, very serious, okay? Question of the day. Question of the day. Question of the day. Maybe? Nah. It almost feels like we need a little bit of a celebration. Every time we get to a 10, it's, it's really nice. Um, I've got my iPad here recording, so hopefully the new audio should be better. Uh, got a nice little lav mic. And the team is working really hard. Uh, Leo, I appreciate your work. Harriet, Sarah, Aliza, working really hard to get us ahead of the drag curve. Last week, well, it doesn't matter to you guys. When you see this, it'll be ages ago, but uh, like last week we were away in Ireland and then um, had our event in Scotland. So um, you, you guys probably saw some of that on Facebook. Leo, if you can link any of it up, that'd be good. Uh, so we had our event there, we spoke in Dublin, and then this week has just been a, me like a bit of a mess trying to catch up with stuff. So we're determined to get ahead of the drag curve so that in the future, if stuff crops up, which it inevitably will, uh, we won't be left, you won't be left in the dark for uh, a considerable length of time as we try and catch up. But I think, I think we've figured out how we're going to do it. Um, really excited about where things are going. And uh, yeah, it's get, getting into the second half of the year. Uh, it's getting very busy. Um, had some nice time off. A little bit of time off, like one afternoon. Uh, went to a wedding. That was lovely. Uh, but other than that, back at it and pushing hard uh, as always. So, got the box back. Feel very happy about that. Uh, need some more questions in here. And I, I do feel a little bit bad about picking questions out of the box all the time, though, because it is a bit of a waste of paper. Maybe we'll figure something different out, but I like the box. The box is staying whatever happens. So it's just me in the office here, Saturday afternoon, still working. Um, but you've got to put the hours in if you want to get where you want to get to. So, great question. Should I give equity or should I give interest to an investor? Well, firstly, I know what my preference is, uh, but this does come back a little bit to what your preferences are, uh, what you're looking to achieve, and the best way to achieve that. The bottom line is, it has to be, in my opinion, it has to be win-win. <coughs> Pardon me. So, whatever is best for you and the investor, do that option. Don't, don't just do one or the other. Um, you've got the flexibility you should have the flexibility in your property business now to be able to do one or the other. So choose which one you want to do, but also work with the investor to find the best solution for them. Um, now, my preference and potentially the thing that you should be aiming for is a debt investment. So what do I mean by debt? What do I mean by equity? So a debt investment is, some, is like, like a mortgage, basically, but from a private investor. So they give you the money on a loan basis and you're going to repay that money back to them over some sort of agreed period of time uh, for a specific asset. So a, a house, a development site, whatever it is, you're going to pay them back um, on terms that you've agreed over a duration that you've agreed. And an equity investment is, say, say you're buying a development site, right, and your investor want some equity. Maybe I'll turn the gain down on this. Ah, I can't turn the gain down any more than that. Sorry. Um, so, say you're going to buy a development and if they want equity, then they're getting a share of that development. So, say your SPV buys a, a special purpose vehicle, buys a site and the site is £100,000. Just to keep the figures easy, right? A hundred grand, and your investor gives you all the money to do that. But they want a fifty percent equity. Then they would have fifty grand's worth, essentially, of that site. But they're giving you all the money. You do all the development, put all the time in, build up this great asset, and um, repay them their capital probably, 
uh, or they just l use it as a loan into the business and then they get the returns. Um, that's one way to work it. The equity side of things, though, is also more risk for an investor to in invest in equity because they're technically liable for um, any uh, excess debt and loans against the property. So say, say that the development doesn't go as planned and you have to raise more finance from a commercial bank or a mortgage, somewhere like that, and then, I don't know, whatever happens, it starts to crumble, and you're left with this big pile of debt to a commercial lender that you have to repay. If someone owns equity in that development, then they, they are also liable to repay that debt, uh, whereas if they're just a debt lender, then they're just one of the other lenders on the other side of the fence that is re expecting returns. So, you know, you've got to ask yourself, what is it that you want to achieve and the best way to do that? Now, why, why choose debt over equity? Um, because debt doesn't tie you in. Uh, you're not tied at the hip. You don't own an asset together for a long period of time. Whereas equity, you're like connected. You own this asset. You can put paperwork in place. You can put processes in place. But essentially, you still own the asset together, uh, whatever way around you want to look at it. And if you're looking to hold a portfolio for an indefinite length of time, then you're actually passing that ownership, joint ownership on um, to your children, their children, or your inheritors of your portfolio. So equity ties you in for a long, get, long period of time. So if you can do an equity investment, look at doing some sort of review period, um, first refusal on, on um, shares that either party might sell, and uh, agree from the outset what the process is. So Maybe you're just going to hold it for 15 years and then sell. Uh, maybe you're going to hold for 10 years and then sell. Equity is good. It is really nice, actually, if you, if you are building to sell um, because it reduces your tensions at the start because the investor owns 50%, but you know that you're going to have a clean break once you've sold all the units. Um, so, yeah, so that's the options. Uh, another thing to consider might be do a debt investment first to see how you work together and then do equity because equity is the easiest it is the easiest and uh, nicest on paper I guess because you know they put the money in but you don't have a debt to repay in a sense uh, if you structure it a certain way then you know like they're putting the money in you're putting the time in and then you own this asset together whereas if they're putting a debt loan in, a debt in then you know you have to make make ship work to be able to repay them so it's just, it's just basically what I'm saying is it has to be win-win uh, like everything in business uh, find the best solution for you find the best solution for them and if they're mutually compatible then go ahead and roll with it but just forward pace and think about what the outcomes and the consequences might be if it goes wrong or if scenario A doesn't happen and it's scenario D or E not even B or C Right, so just think and forward pace. If you're happy with the consequences and the potential downsides and the upside outweighs that, then roll on with it and just crack on. Okay, what due diligence do you do? By that, I, I'm assuming you mean what the due diligence that we do here, um, or I do. Uh, so we have a couple of processes that we use. Uh, we tend to try and invest in areas that we know. And that's the first one. And if we don't know them, we tend to try and partner with someone in the area that knows that area well. Uh, because local knowledge is invaluable. Uh, but when you look at the large scale um, investors and investment um, groups and things like that, they don't operate in a very micro area. They operate on a large scale all over the place. The way that they do that is they have local knowledge. Um, they're just leveraging local experts. So that's something that we try to do. We always try to have some sort of local knowledge of the area or borrow local knowledge, essentially, of the local area. Uh, you can do that too. Uh, just team up with people. <clears throat> um, but make sure that you're offering something in return. So, you know, you have to have some sort of offering to make it a viable partnership. Then, on top of that, if we're doing investments in... Let's start with uh, smaller units, so residential units, so houses, flats, service accommodation, HMOs. Okay, we just roll through it, so we're investing in a good area, we're, we have the local knowledge, so we know where we want to invest. Then we do some market research, so say you're looking to rent rooms, right? Know what the room rent is, room rates are in the area. Go have a look at a couple, 
to see what your comp competition is like. Um, we're quite happy in some of the areas we are because the run rates aren't great, but we know that by offering a good, a better service, so a much nicer house, not shabby and run down like our competitors, then we're able to glean a little bit more rent, but also we fully expect and are retaining tenants for longer, even though we're having trouble with neighbours and other things that are kind of out of our control that would push tenants out straight away in a shabbier place. Because we've got such a, so our units are so much nicer, um, and we know they're nicer because we've seen the competition, uh, our tenants are like sticking it out because they, they also don't want to leave, and we don't want them to leave either, obviously. So check the room rates, check the local area, check the local competition, do the same on service accommodation, um, and then the next thing we do is we run the figures as if it was a single let. So what do I mean by that? So, okay, great, we're trying to buy this house to do HMO, to do room, re room rents. Let's not do a full-blown multi-let, okay? We just want to rent the rooms out for higher yield. But what if um, that goes to pot or what if something happens and we need to convert it back to single let? If it works as a single let, i.e. it's got a reasonable yield, 6 to 8%, maybe 10 um, if we're lucky, then it's probably a goer. Uh, if, there, if it doesn't work as a single let, then we have to seriously consider um, what the implications are. With HMOs, it's a little different because we want to knock, you want to knock the internal walls around, right? You want to reconfigure it because that's how you're able to generate commercial lending uh, if it doesn't have the same internal structures. So do all that, run the figures on a single let, and if it still stacks up, then it's a reasonable investment. Then what you also want to do, okay, is it runs as a single let and you know what the figures might be for a multi-let or a service accommodation, run those and see what your returns are, and see what your time investment is, and check whether you want to, whether you want to make that extra added time and cost investment, um, because maybe you don't. Maybe your investor that you're raising finance from doesn't want to add the extra time and the effort and the energy and concerns. So you have to work with them on that. So run everything as a single let, check it still works, have local knowledge, and then um, obviously just raise the finance. Run through the process of purchasing, and then obviously you've got the whole conversion and all that sort of stuff to do. Uh, next, for the larger sites, we have, a, we have some calculators that we've built. Well, we've not built them. Uh, one of our partners in Scotland built them, so big shout out to you, Alan. Um, maybe link him up down here if I give you his details, Leo. Uh, big shout out to Alan. Uh, he's been, him and Gary have been developing with partners now, very exciting, for um, a long time. And uh, he's kindly let us use their calculators, um, which is something we were building, um, but it's just made our transition into developments much easier and much simpler. Um, so we have a site calculator that, you know, based on local national build cost per square meter, national sales cost per square meter, we can do a very quick back of the fag packet or napkin style review of a site to see whether it's worth our time and energy to check it out anymore. Then the next thing we do again, this is with local knowledge um, to some degree, not as it explicitly but some local knowledge because we have to expand you expand your field when you're doing the development so over a larger area uh, then we go through and we use things hang on i'm going to see if i can find it things like is it josh left it here okay then we go in and we do a full appraise we do a more of a bigger appraisal using tools like this um, which gives you like build costs in in geographical locations oh in different geographical locations. So it gives you the build costs, and we look at um, comparables, and we do all of that to give a reasonable um, sales. <coughs> to get, I just pulled the mic out. To give a reasonable sales estimate, if we were to sell them, uh, do some calls around, um, do some local reviews on rental values, speak to some local agents. So basically what we're doing now is trying to get all of our costings up and our forecasts up and so that we know that they're a bit more accurate than just estimating using a national averages. Then what we do is we would also include in that costs for uh, legals, uh, architects, fees, um, all of that sort of thing and 
all of the fees that come along with purchasing a property and a development site. Uh, then, we'd, then as we take that process through, what we're trying to do, what you're trying to do, is just solidify what those expenses might be, and then, essentially, what you want to do is stress test. So make the, sorry, I'm brains fried today. Um, make the costs higher and make the returns lower and stress test it and if it still works then it's a reasonable investment then you just take it through and you would uh, raise finance uh, either from a partner from a commercial lender uh, anything like that and uh, take the development through to the next stage so what you will find though is that with all of these everything okay there's a lot of due diligence to do um, the returns, the due diligence that you should do gets more as the returns get and the risk gets bigger. Um, but also, you know, it's not every single site that you do due diligence on becomes a investment or a development site. You have to do diligence on several and then maybe one drops through. So that's all I'd say. Uh, the other thing to do if you're looking at targeted commercial like we're trying to do a little bit of, so commercial buildings for blue chip companies like McDonald's, Nero's, Nero's, um, Starbucks, uh, KFC, uh, Co-op, Tesco's, okay, take some dummy sites to them, uh, some sites that you've seen that might work, take them to them, uh, and then open up a conversation with them about, okay, this might not be the right site for you, but you've made contact with them, build a relationship, and then once they've given you specific guidance on what they're looking for, you can go out and look for that, um, and it will save you a hell of a lot of time. So that's what we do on the due, due diligence process. I hope that's enough for you. If you want any more, just give me, an, give me another shout and maybe we'll do a, a larger session on it. Uh, Josh is doing some examples of the diligence process we're following now for um, commercial and residential developments. So that's it. And just to go out and speak to people as well. If you're trying to find more sites, go and speak to people, uh, architects, um, contractors, engineers, all of that f f sort of thing. Cool, so what are we on now? Okay, one more I think, one more. Just because I'm having fun. Ah, nice question. What is build to hold? Okay, so build to hold is a strategy and have I got the paper with me? It was actually in the paper recently. Uh, not that one, not that one. I don't know if I've brought it with me, but the face of property is changing and it's actually bloody exciting. Um, no, I've left it at home. It was in the Financial Times last weekend, uh, but that will mean nothing to you by the time you see this because there's a wee delay. Never mind. Um, build to hold is a strategy. Literally what it says on the tin, right? You build something to hold it. You don't want to sell it. You want to build it and rent it. Um, I think it's a very, very exciting model. Uh, something that I am very interested in. We collectively are very interested in build to hold. Uh, we're looking at doing some of it right now, and I think it's going to become more prevalent as time wears on. Uh, why? Because society in general is beginning to rent things. They're, they're, not, they're interested in having the nicest, best option now, and not having to wait to save the money to buy it later. Does that make sense? So, people are leasing brand new cars they never they never own the car but they're leasing it instead of saving up to buy a car um, another story on financials there uh, behind that but instead of saving up to buy a nice new car they can lease it for two three hundred four hundred five hundred six hundred pounds a month um, and get a very expensive fancy looking car with all the bells and whistles uh, I fully expect that this will begin to happen as well in property. Uh, we're already seeing a transition and um, this is slightly to do with people at the bottom end of the market feeling like they're pushed out uh, but also because as a society we just like renting things now. Um, don't own it, we just rent it and you know it means you're not tied to any specific place. You can rent a lovely home and if you decide next year that you don't want to live there anymore, you want to move to Canada or you want to move to somewhere else, you can just get up and leave. Uh, you're not tied there, and and yeah, so I, I see it happening. I see it progressing quite a lot. Um, but the article in the paper, it, Leo, remind me if I can find the link, then um, we'll put that up somewhere. Um, but 
there is a new trend as well in the build to hold sector which is quite exciting it's, the best way i can describe it is like building um student halls for adults i know students at university are adults but like real adults um so instead of just being a block of flats with um 11 two beds in or whatever it is right they have a block of flats but they also have a gym and um, maybe they have some cafes and things in the bottom floor on the commercial side of things so essentially um, larger institutions are starting to build estates that they then rent instead of selling uh, it's very exciting uh, institutions are liking the look of this uh, new model because rental income is very um, relatively stable compared to other investments and it gives a fair amount of creativity graduates flip and love it because it's like being back in uni again but also you can get like a whole array of people you're building like a community that you're then going to rent um, and so you can do things like uh, having social functions and things put on and managed by the managers of this block uh, it seems like a lot of work but you can push your rent up considerably um, by operating under this principle which is quite exciting and quite interesting. I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but it's very cool. The other really interesting thing about build to hold strategies is that you don't need to adhere to the same construction techniques um, as build to sell. What do I mean by that is that in the build to sell model, the only mortgaging and lending that people can typically get is for standard brick built units. But standard brick built units are slow, outdated, and rubbish, essentially, compared to other options. Um, whereas in a build to hold strategy, because you're raising commercial finance, or you would be raising commercial finance for a scale of them, you can build it using um, timber frames, prefab cuts. Um, potentially in the future, we might be able to look at printing options. Um, you can. Uh, structure things so that you've got nice integration you got like you can put some bells and whistles in there and you can put it up a lot quicker and still raise finance against it whereas if you're building to sell you have to consider what the lender what the buyer would be able to raise against the property and you have to make sure it's at a low enough price that you'll be able to sell enough of them yada 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 so build to hold is very exciting it gives you as an investor and developer a lot of creativity to build a nice home something that feels nice people don't want to leave but equally, it gives you great long-term interests and investments. If you look at the way that the market is shifting and adapting, I think that there will be considerably more build-to-hold strategies um, being pushed out. Uh, the government is trying to um, basically muscle out accidental landlords with one or two properties, and instead they're trying to invite in the institutions the large lenders so that they can start building and um, developing large scale buy to lets that are run in a professional manner. So this whole model is going to take off massively I think in the next few years and we're going to see a lot of a shift in the marketplace towards it and I don't think there's going to be as much resistance from renters as, um, as people are expecting because when renters see how great it is to live in this lovely place well, oh my gym's just there or my cafe's just there the social functions oh this is so much better than saving up and living in a crappy place so i can save up enough of a deposit to buy my own place i think it's going to be very exciting and i am very excited where this is going and i've got some great plans lined up for it as well so question of the day would you live in a unit like that 